Good morning, everyone. Happy G Dev Conning. Shall we start with a joke? Uh, knock, knock. Who's there? Not Jim Kring. Um, I'm, I'm Tom McQuillan. I'm a, a senior software engineer for uh, JKI. And Jim apologizes that he couldn't be here um, today. He was really looking forward to it, but couldn't make it. He says he's here in spirit, which might explain that slight chill in the air. Um, <laughs> But no, all jokes aside, Jim is a, a great boss, great uh, programming buddy. I've been working with him uh, a lot. So one of the projects that I want to speak to you about is the idea of having G anywhere. Um, and the reason why I love LabVIEW, I love working with LabVIEW, and where I use LabVIEW are mostly on these targets. Windows, Ubuntu, Linux, RTOS, um, FPGAs, well, not so much Mac OS, but it's, it's available for us to use. And with LabVIEW, another reason why I just love it so much is we can communicate with anything, whether that's through direct messaging um, like this, or maybe a shared resource like an OPC server for, um, or like Escada systems. Um, after yesterday's presentation, I thought I needed a, uh, a clause here. Um, but yeah, this is why I think I love LabVIEW. But, so we can communicate with, with anything, but how do we get LabVIEW into anything? Other people get to program natively onto, onto targets, so why not us? And what would it take us as a community to do that? So where LabVIEW could be, it'd be great if we could take our G and compile it using WebAssembly to have like complex multi-page web applications, or like JavaScript for that matter. What if we had a zero-page application? Something that just runs in the console that a user doesn't need to use, but maybe you have a debug log in the console. Um, ARM processors, Emerson, probably a good shout. Be nice to program some of their hardware. And what about something crazy like bare metal programming on microcontrollers? How could we go about that? Something with no operating system. Suffolk with limited uh, static RAM. Uh, this presentation, I think, appends really nicely to some of the work that uh, Nathan has done, uh, where we can write uh, web VIs that run on, on this. This presentation is going to be an alternative approach, give us more selection as a community. Because our friends over in MicroPython, C, Rust, they can all do this, so why, why is it difficult for for LabVIEW developers, for G developers, what will it take? To answer that question, we need a bit of an understanding about the current compiler stack. We're going to start off with writing our code in G. Hopefully, we are familiar with this step. And we want to stick to writing in G because it's awesome. Like, I, I don't know any other language where we can do such concurrent code so easily. And the debugging capabilities of G is great. The data flow paradigms of G make it amazing. We all know about the broken run arrow. This is a step in the compiler stack which essentially validates your code. It sees, because LabVIEW is a, a strictly typed language, if you try to wire a string into an add function, it's going to break. You've broken the syntax. So that's what the type propagation algorithm does. Um, it does more complex things as well, actually. Like the, for the format into string function, your, your number of declared variables has to match the number of input parameters if it's statically uh, connected. Um, and it's about this sort of stage in the compiler stack where we go from our G into some sort of IR, um, intermediate representation. And you might have thought of this before, but whenever we program in G, we are creating a graph. Every VI you create is a graph. Let's just rotate this, and you can see it clearly. And we can represent this graph as an object. And from this object, we can perform uh, algorithms on this object, maybe uh, do some optimizations on this object. We can traverse through this object and delete anything that we might uh, not need or might not be called. 
the fun thing about this slide is I've taken a graphical language, I've transformed it into IR, um, ASG, Abstract Semantic Graph, which is an object, but for the slide, I've made it graphical so we can understand what's happening, and so I've gone full circle back into G. So this ASG is an object that we can perform <laughs> operations on. In fact, the next stage in this compile stack is where the weird magic happens. All the lappy superstitions that people like Stephen Loftus Mercer tell us are happening in the compile stack. Things like um, code elimination. If there are frames in your um, frames in your case structures that can never be called, then they are removed um, from the graph. Uh, anything that could happen outside of a loop uh, will be moved outside of the loop using the um, DIFRA uh, data flow intermediate representation. And notice how this is on a loop. We've got shift registers here, and because if we do some constant folding, we've changed that graph, and because of that, maybe there's some, a new area of unreachable code which we can further optimize. But yeah, this is where all that labby superstition happens. And this is at a slightly higher level than the, well, the low level, uh, virtual machine, which is an open source compiler. The LabVRND team added the LLVM compiler uh, a few releases after the initial conception of LabVIEW. And we saw about a 20% um, increase in performance by adding this open source compiler. An open source compiler that's used by Rust and lots of other uh, languages. The actual mechanics of how LLVM work is sort of a mystery to me. It's too low level for me to properly understand without really studying the, the compiler tool chain. But it's where we might get individual, like almost assembly level instructions and, and combine them, do aggressive code analysis and removal. Um, until we get something that's almost machine code, but not quite. It's LLVM uh, uh, AR, um, assembly representation. Um, now, the LLVM, I said, is an, an open source compiler. And right at the top of the LLVM foundation is Tanya uh, Latter who has a very established, extinguished um, career from being a, a researcher through to compiler engineer through to working on Apple's compiler. Um, so her software uh, that she's been using has been used by hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of people around the globe. And she's been president of the LLVM Foundation for, for a long time. Um, the more I look into the LLVM Foundation, the more I'm encouraged by the programming community as a whole. There's entire sections on their website about um, STEM outreach and promoting diversity in, in our communities. And so they are like, actively taking a leading step um, in that. Okay, so now that we've got our LLVM um, assembly or assembly representation, we can go on to the LabVIEW runtime. And again, the runtime was something which eluded me for a long time. I thought, why do we need a runtime? Why do we need another program to run G? Well, we take in this LLVM um, AR, and it's at this point where it uses a just-in-time compiler, much like Java, to compile it into native machine code. And then from that machine code, the the LabVIEW runtime can schedule those individual tasks which have been clumped and put them on uh, appropriate threads. So we can have a sense of concurrency. Strictly speaking, we don't need a runtime. Uh, if think of uh, programming an FPGA, the FPGA doesn't have a runtime. We're programming metal. We wouldn't need a runtime for like Windows targets, for Intel chips. But the alternative of a runtime would be to read through the Intel chipset API and do very low level thread management. 
runtimes give us a layer of abstraction. So we don't need to do that for every target. So this is the, gen the general compiler stack for um, general purpose operating systems and their chipsets. It's obviously different for um, FPGA. And then, yeah, we finally have our target at the end. Um, it's going to be Intel processors. But it would be nice if we didn't have to use Intel, if we could have other um, targets. So what could we change as a community to the stack so we could program anything? Well, we want to keep G. We love G. We're all here. Type propagation, that's a great tool. I don't want to lose that ability of instant feedback. Is my code ready and does it work? And then there's this magic black box of mystical beings, which is the low level stuff. That would be a lot of work to, to recreate. So could we leverage other people's um, or other boxes in this chain? Well, to pick out the boxes that we want, um, let's analyze what we need. We need something that has sort of inherent concurrency, that's able to schedule um, parallel tasks. We want something that's known to, to work with bare metal, FPGA, consoles, and anything you want to be able to, to program, or at least serving the mainstream. There's always uh, corner cases. And something that's very lab view i.e. very strictly typed. Um, now, all of this sort of tends towards our favorite buzzword of the moment, which is Rust. Um, and more specifically, using a Rust runtime called Tokyo. Tokyo allows us to do those um, concurrent schedulings. So what do we need to to get there to use the Rust toolchain. Now, assuming we've worked out a way of, um, I see people taking photos. This doesn't exist, by the way. Um, so, but assuming we've made a way of linking to this Rust toolchain where we can just do like control save and then it happens in the background. Um, we don't want to yeah, go out of our way to do this. But so assuming this step is done, we've triggered the process. How do we bridge the gap from G over there to Rust. Well, we've already established G is a graph, but we're going to graphify it a bit more into IR, intermediate representation. And then from there, we can take this object, traverse over the graph, and then create our Rust. Um, oh yeah, one step. We need to be able to clump that graph to say, what do we want to happen in parallel with each other? Um, and then we can generate our Rust. OK, abstract semantic graph, going to G into um, the IR. This, there, there are loads of ways that we could do this. This isn't a step in the process I'm particularly concerned about. We could traverse over our uh, LAVI block diagrams. We can read the linker information in the background of our block diagrams. or we can use another tool, which I'll uh, briefly show you later, where you can dynamically create this graph as we're running our code. You know, the point of this slide is just to show you that this graph is an object, and we can take that object and do algorithms and, and traverse over it. Now, a big thing about LabVIEW is data flow and the concurrent nature of, of data flow. Um, when I put these slides together, I was thinking, yeah, this sort of clumping makes sense. We have these two blocks in um, individual threads. They run together. They join um, at the end and, and print our statement, print our answer. But none of these functions are blocking functions. They take basically no time to execute. So we could just clump all of this together. And when I say clump, I'm talking about taking a group of code, flattening it into sequential operations. Think of um, like the von Neumann um, architecture for processes where we can take an instruction, execute it, and then 
put the results into a memory space, even go to the next instruction, execute it, maybe use the, the memory allocated previously. But it's a very sequential operation. With clumping, we're taking the code, clumping it, flattening it into a sequential operation so it can be executed. The code you see on the board here, this is blocking code. Um, those of us who have got CLAD uh, level AV, can someone shout out how long should this code take to execute? So now I'm feeling brave enough. There's lots of LabVIEW champions in here. We can do this. Huh? Oh, I had a couple of answers there. Um, but yeah, 60 milliseconds. The 50 and 40, they'll execute at the same time. We've got 10 at the end. Great, 60 milliseconds. If we clumped all of this together into one thread, how long would this code take to execute? 100 milliseconds, yeah. So the difficulty is, how do we, how do we perform clumping? Um, let's have a look at this code. So let's play a clumping game. And if it's not big enough already, we can zoom. Amazing. Right. So in this clumping game, we want to wrap up, uh, wrap up functions that we can safely flatten without changing um, data flow. So in other words, what could we wrap around, what could we wrap with flat sequences that wouldn't change the data flow? And for now, flat sequence structures are going to represent a thread where we can launch the encapsulated code, execute it sequentially, that's the important thing here, in then wait on the values. All of this still needs to follow the data flow paradigms that we have in G, that a node will not execute until all of its inputs are valid, and a node won't output any outputs until all of the outputs are valid. So at the moment, if we clump it all like this, it's going to take 100 milliseconds to execute. Is everyone with me? Because this is all happening in one thread. 50 plus 40 plus 10. We could wrap up the individual blocking pieces of code into individual threads. We could do this. And so as our code executes, we get to the corner of the flat sequence structure. We then launch a thread, we execute a task, and then we collect the results. And that can happen in parallel now because we have, we're declaring two threads. Well, technically, we have a third thread, which is the, the root loop, which is, I guess, the uh, bottom level uh, LabVIEW lock diagram. Now, should we have these functions running on the root loop, the loop that's doing all of the, the scheduling uh, for the threads? Probably not. Um, so what we could do is try and clump these together. So we can clump this function and the blocking code. We could uh, clump this together. Everyone happy? Now, what would happen if we clumped this together? Why is it wrong? Yeah, absolutely. So what I've done here, I've clumped it, so I've changed the data flow. A node won't execute until all of its valid, until all of its inputs are valid. The input here of this clump isn't valid until an output happens here. So if we do control Z, so we could wrap it up like this. And I suppose we could actually, we could clump that together like so. We could clump this. And although it's a constant, it's still a node in our graph. 
So technically, we could just clump this constant. Um, so this is sort of the game that we have to play when developing our compiler. How do we group together bits of G that can all run um, synchronously, so that can all run asynchronously, but in each of those clumps, be synchronous? Um, cool. Oh, I actually have some Rust to show you. OK, the code that's about to load, hopefully we can flatten this down. The Rust here is the equivalent of clumping the entire block diagram into one clump. We are flattening that block diagram into sequential calls. We're um, initializing our, um, our variables. We're calling well, some mass functions, I think. Yeah, so the subtract, we're calling a wait function. We're waiting for that to complete, calling the next wait function. Um, and yeah, more maths, and then final, the third wait function. Oh, and another great thing about this is I'll show you how we dynamically create this from G um, a bit later. But we have the ability to print to a console, a concept that we don't have in G at the moment. I run this code, we want it to take 60 milliseconds. Instead, it takes 130. Um, theoretically, it should take 100, maybe bugs. Um, so next, if we do clumping, so we wrap up it's just the blocking calls um, in these clumps, we could do these, we're um, declaring that we want to use threads. And if we go into the code, here we are going to spawn a thread and move a function call into that thread. The function call we're moving is wait. So this section of code happens very quickly. It was just calling the asynchronous node and then moving on to the next line. The next line is spawning another thread and moving another wait function. In then we move on to the next line. Now we still need to do data flow. And so at this point, there are no other dependencies. So it's just waiting for those two threads to complete. Um, if then we can get those values and continue. So we're joining those threads back into the root loop. Um, we have yeah, one final um, operation in then Lastly, we do a final wait. Uh, do you know why it takes 130 instead of 100? Do you have an answer for me? Or I, OK, go on. <coughs> well, the, the output also takes 40. So the one yes. Done, You're right. The, so with the wait uh, millisecond function, the input is the number of uh, milliseconds you want to wait. The output is the tick count. So yeah. the documentation is wrong. It's not saying it's 40. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So, yeah, lastly, um, we have a blocking call here. But although it's a blocking call that we could launch uh, asynchronously, there are no other dependencies on it. It's not going to halt um, data flows, which is why I haven't wrapped it um, in a thread. Um, if we run this, there you go, total execution time. Uh, 60 milliseconds. Cool. Um, any questions, comments, or thoughts about anything I've gone through so far? Awesome. Everyone's understanding everything perfectly. Tom, do we need to consider also the wetness algorithm for when we're creating buffer allocation capabilities? Um, we as LabVIEW developers, or G developers, know because we will call, we will end up calling the, the Rust tool chain, and the Rust tool chain can deal with that. Um, but, but does the Rust tool chain also automatically make sub arrays? Um, that would make a huge difference. 
That might be a question for James McNally. So the remark was, should, should we uh, consider area allocations or buffer allocations? And Tom said, no, uh, Rust will take care of that. Um, but LabVIEW automatically makes sub-arrays and substrings. And if Rust doesn't also do that, it might still make more copies of large data sets. So it, uh, if I were to make uh, break this down in clumps, I would consider uh, the, the order of arrays and buffers. So the way that Rust would handle that, the thing that doesn't map well into to, to LabVIEW is at some point you have to create that memory in Rust. So that is happening behind the scenes in LabVIEW. I don't know exactly how. Um, Subarrays, though, does work. So it will then look at that by reference. Um, that comes down to, obviously, there's a step in the middle of this, right, which is taking the G code into that. So you'd have to build that into there. But yeah, you, you can make it efficiently. The thing I don't have a very good mental model of is how you would, when in the process, you would allocate that in the first place. Um, because LabVIEW will reuse buffers each time around. Um, whereas Rust, normally, that's for the developer to decide where, at what point that happens. OK. Yeah, cheers, James. I spoke to James before this presentation because he has much more knowledge on Rust than, than I do. Um, cool, where were we? Um, shall we d create some Rust? Actually, um, I have some code here which I'm going to call ASG or dynamic G. Um, what this code is doing, it will dynamically create this intermediate representation in the background. So although it looks like LabVIEW just with a nice green hue, um, as it executes, it's generating this, um, this graph object, and then it can trigger the transpile uh, process, which is why we can do things like print to the console or read from the console, um, things that we don't have in LabVIEW. Uh, this is a simple y equals mx plus c um, code. And if I run this, there you go, simple transpile. You can have a look at the IR, the intermediate representation. So as that code executed, it generated this graph, this object which we can then iterate over. And the thing it was doing as it was iterating over that object was actually compiling it, well, translating it into Rust. And then once we've got something in Rust, we can use all of the Rust tool chains that we want. And one really neat thing I wanted to mention previously but forgot was in other programming languages, let's say uh, Python, for example, we download an IDE like Spider. We can separately download different compilers, different compiler stacks for that IDE. So the IDE and the compilers are separate, and you can sort of mix and match depending on the target you want or, or your project. With LabVIEW, you download the IDE, and the compiler is all wrapped up. It's all bundled. The, the program that we write in, in G, in the IDE, we don't really have a choice at the moment. Well, we have the choice between, like, LabVIEW RT or FPGA or Windows. Um, did we run this? Oh, yeah, so this code was generated um, using our proof of concept uh, transpiler, and it works, which is nice. And just to show you that this code is being generated dynamically, um, I can change uh, the block diagram. Let's just take this down here. Yeah, I'm not quite used to the new animations in uh, Q3. Yeah. Don't mind me. Nice. OK, so I now run this code. There you go. I thought it was about to crash. It didn't. We're good. Let's show this graph, and hopefully we see the updated. Yeah. So if you tilt your head to the side, you will see this code represented 
in this graph. We can then take it over to the Rust playground, see it was uh, transpiled into Rust, um, and we get a number. The number is over one, so we know that um, it actually worked. Um, questions, comments, whilst I go back to this? Cool. So instead of going through all of the slides there, what I did was just show you in, in LabVIEW what we're, we're doing when it comes to clumping. We could clump all of our code, flatten it into a single thread. We could take individual, um, so we could clump individual blocking functions, flatten those, and run them sequentially. Um, and then once we've decided how it's going to be clumped, it can then be traversed into uh, Rust or whatever language you want. It doesn't have to be Rust. Um, it's just to demystify how we're going from this object into the Rust source code. We can just go through this object, traverse through all of the nodes and dependencies. And then the impl implementation here is we get the object and then look in a lookup table for the correct syntax of that function. And then we get our Rust out on this side. The, this project uh, that JKI and um, a few other developers are working on is in the early stages and there's a lot we still need to figure out. But I'm really excited by the, the possibilities of writing, doing my development in G, which I love, and being able to program any, any target. Uh, so what we've spoken about here is we want to use G to write a, some sort of transpiler that generates another language that we can then leverage their tool chain. I find it slightly odd that we're, we're writing Rust in in LabVIEW, but we end up with Rust source code on the output, and then we can use whatever uh, targets we want. So, what now? Well, there are still questions to be answered, like this clumping algorithm. Um, Jim is working on like several proof concepts of algorithms and defining rules for the algorithm. That should we just take every blocking function, like the weight or an event structure or a DQ message uh, function and wrap those all in individual threads and leave everything else on the root loop. How could we optimize that? Should we try and put as much into um, clumps as we can without breaking data flow? Or is there somewhere in between? We, we don't know what the rules are at the moment, but we know where we want to get to. Uh, graph library, we want, well, yeah, we need a better education of graph theory in, in LabVIEW. I've not really heard it spoken about, but I've heard there's a great presentation coming up that might help us out. And we need a general greater education in, in compilers, compiler theory, transpilers, um, so we can leverage the tools that are already out there in the community and bring them over to our community, which I, know, I think that would be awesome. Cool, and I guess, with that, I will just say uh, thank you very much. So, does anyone have any questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. So what I never understood about this concept is why would you put VIs or functions on a VI and then run it instead of making a VI and then getting the ASD from the VI mm. by scripting? So, that's, that's a great question, and I've... You, you I, can do both. Yeah, we, we can do both. The getting G into that intermediate representation, I'm not concerned about, because there are many ways of, of doing that. We can just take the LabVIEW linker information and, and parse that into an object. The thing I'm skeptical about that, though, both be straightforward, is we're then dependent on NI to keep 
everything the same. If they make a change to that, then our tools change. Um, yeah, with, with those dynamic functions I, I showed earlier, we, we are in full control. We can define the syntax for um, all of those functions. But yeah, I agree with you. We could just traverse block diagrams. Uh, where's John Medland? Like, he could probably create a program that uh, takes a PNG of the um, block diagram and then does object recognition to, to, tra to uh, traverse it. Um, great question, though. Um, any other questions? Uh, in the center here, Mike Frank? Um, thank, thank you very much for a great presentation. Um, it's a very exciting topic and uh, seems extremely ambitious as well, which is fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, are there plans to make this open source? Um, is, is, that, is that the plan going forward to kind of enable more people to, to help? That's the direction I would like to, to see it go. Um, I can't speak on, well, I am speaking on behalf of Jim, I suppose. <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, business decisions like that, I'm not sure, but I think either way it will enable the Lavi community to do great things and leverage technologies, which would be awesome. Right. Um, uh, got it. And just because um, I, uh, I, I fully agree with what you said, that um, it's, it's probably going to require a huge amount of effort mm. to make to bring it to a point where you can take an arbitrary piece of lab code and actually run it like this it seems probably years and years of, of work and optimizations and, and so on yeah. so it's a huge project absolutely I think on that point um, regarding lab view primitives there's there's there are a finite number of primitives so there is an end goal in sight but if we think of the bell curve of the of primitives versus usage will focus on um, primitives that are used all the time, starting with the programming palette, um, and then working towards the tails on, on either side. Um, and I think for that very reason, like we need as many people who are invested in this to, to develop these um, transpilers. Uh, and also, I mentioned uh, Nathan earlier about the work he was doing with uh, Cordova. Uh, where you can take web VIs and, and run those on um, Android or, or iOS. I think there's, there's a place for that in here as well. In the transpiler, um, it's a, like the visitor pattern where we can visit different um, lookup tables. We could visit um, the Rust lookup table or the Python. Well, Python might be a bit tricky just because it's not strictly typed, but um, we could visit other languages as well. Um, I've got a, a, a related question uh, um, about the, the open source nature of it. So one, one reason I, I asked whether it will be open source is um, because I, I imagine it would be extremely useful uh, to perhaps have the involvement of people who have worked in the NI mm. R&D department. For example, uh, Stephen Loftus Mercer, uh, and, and others who uh, perhaps have worked on these sorts of issues for years, so they have huge amount of knowledge of, of kind of the pitfalls and so on. Um, and I was wondering if there's kind of any plan to kind of involve them in, in, in it. Uh, thank you. I know that Jim has a lot of contacts that he's reaching out to. Uh, so there's uh, Matt and James. Um, so, what do you see the persona of the average user of this is with, because you're, ste you're stepping on like the, the gray area of people technically running code that they may not understand when it's, it's technically running Rust. Do you see people diversifying and learning Rust and then using this toolkit or is this 
uh, a good entryway in, in achieving the goal without needing to learn Rust. It might be a good, good entryway. I, I suppose the thing is, the end goal wouldn't be running Rust. The end goal is running machine code. And at the moment, when we're developing in G, we're not running G on, on targets. We're running machine code, which I don't understand. Um, so I, I, yeah, I think two different routes to the same uh, destination. Uh, there was uh, James here in Van Nathan. I think we've only got one minute left, so probably just the, the one question and pick up the rest in Discord, if that's OK. Oh, I might be a bit annoying then, because I was actually just going to talk to Petru's point a little bit about NIR and D. I think, because this is just a general good thing to be aware of with, with any projects like this, the problem with getting NIR and D involved, or people from NIR and D, is you've got to think about the intellectual property case of that. So if they have seen how LabVIEW does it, and they come and repeat that in here, then you can end up in legal gray areas. So while it would be really good, it's also something that you have to be really careful about with projects like this, that there can be any question of whether the IP has been developed by the community or come from, from LabVIEW. Of course, if we can get cooperation from LabVIEW, that NI, that's a different <laughs> thing as well. But. Nice. Was that a quick question? Not really. Okay, let's chat later. Good stuff. Thank you very much, Tom. All right, cheers. cheers. Thanks, everyone.